All right, hello, hello, hello all, and welcome to the webinar on debunking. Uh, looking at the, the folks signed in here, it looks like we've got a very full house. Um, we're, we've got a maximum of 100 people and we've got 99 signed in, so thank you all for coming. <laughs> this should be great. Um, okay. Yep, and there we hit our limit of 101. So uh, I want to jump right into it. Uh, so we have lots of time for questions at the end. I just want to do a really quick orientation for those of you who haven't used this software before. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. There are, um, if you have questions, those of you who are logged in on in the, the control panel, there's a little place where it looks like there, there's a microphone and there's a little camera thing. And there should be something that looks a lot like a hand. If you mash that, it'll signal that you want us to unmute you so that you can ask a question or make a comment. There is also um, a questions interface where you can type in a question to us and then I'll either read it off to, to John and Shauna or, uh, or I'll just type an answer back to you. So uh, without further ado then, welcome Shauna Thiel from Media Matters for America and John Cook from the University of Queens Queensland. The, I'm going to get the name of the institute wrong, John, so I'll, I'll let you. The Global Change Institute. Global Change Institute. I was going to mix everything up. Uh, John is also associated with the, uh, with skeptic, skepticalscience.com, which is a, a wonderful resource for uh, debunkings of common myths and uh, claims that people make about climate change. Media Matters for America, if you're not familiar with it, does a lot of work to address misrepresentations and spin and bias in the media. And there's a lot of, of uh, great up-to-date rapid response to, uh, to things that people say uh, that's wrong. And Shauna focuses on their climate and energy side of things. So uh, she, she and John are sort of the, the yin and yang of John takes on the long-term debunking and she takes on the, the, the immediate debunking. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Josh Rose now. I work here at the National Center for Science Education, where we deal with uh, climate denial and evolution denial, creationism in schools. So we have, I have a little bit of expertise on, on both sides of that and uh, look forward to talking to all of you about everything that we're gonna do here. So again, if you have questions, type those in or, or raise your hand. There will be, we've left plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Um, but don't be afraid to type questions in as we go, and, and I can either answer you right away or, or hold those for later. And we want to start off with a little bit of a role playing. So we're going to pretend that the three of us are just having a, a Thanksgiving dinner or a, hanging out at Memorial Day barbecue. And I see John, and he says that he works at the Global Change Institute. And I say, I don't know, John, this whole climate change thing, I, I heard it stopped warming in 1998. And I have had that kind of conversation quite often too when I when I bring up my work. So, so um, well, you know, Josh, that's that's a good point. You know, but but global warming hasn't stopped in 1998, and, and even though you hear a lot of people say that that um, 1998 was the hottest year on record, and, and yes, it is true that there hasn't been any statistically significant warming since 1998, but but that doesn't take into account the fact that that the global surface temperature record that shows a lot of interannual variability from year to year. And so, therefore, if you're trying to work out a long-term trend in a noisy signal like that, you can't uh, just work off short-term periods. You need to have at least a 15-year long-term, um, a 15-year period or longer to work out a statistically significant trend to a 95% confidence interval. So I hope that clears it up. I'm completely convinced, John. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, so if you, for those of you who, uh, who, who didn't guess, that John, John was doing a, uh, a less than ideal debunking there on purpose to illustrate some of the things that, that can go wrong when we, when we get into this. So um, do you want to just talk a little bit about what, what we think went a little bit wrong there? Shauna, do you have, any, do you, do you have a, a critique of, of what you're Yeah, so, I, so definitely John uh, first familiarize people with the myth. The first thing that he says is he repeats the myth. Uh, he says, 
warming hasn't uh, stopped since 1998. Mm -hmm. He has a not, but he's repeating the myth. Uh, I think that a second thing that he did was use a lot of technical terms that if you're at a barbecue, it might not get across. Uh, and so people, when they're confused about something, they don't believe it. Uh, they think maybe you're just using nonsense terms to try to throw them off. Uh, so simple explanation stuff. I think those are the two main things that he did wrong. John, John do you have other techniques that you use to do a bad debunking? Uh, well, I went through the list of all the things you shouldn't do and pretty much did all of them. Um, the, I guess the other thing was, was, as well as just saying a negation of the myth, global warming has not stopped. I also then repeated the myth, reinforced it in a, a few different ways, talking about 1998 being the hottest year on record, which it isn't, 2005 and 2010. About horror, but also talking about uh, a common variant of that myth is there's been no statistically significant warming in 1998, which is a really um, it's a really uh, sort of confusing uh, phrase for people because they don't know what statistically significant warming trend means. So all they hear is no warming trend. So so yeah, I reinforce the myth in a number of different ways. And then, yeah, just, just use a lot of jargon and also just overkill. Um, just gave a long, uh, complicated response. And, and if, if a debunking is longer and more complicated than a myth, which is a real challenge because myths are often very simple and the, the scientific answer is quite, quite nuanced. But, but if, you, if you fall into the trap of being more complicated than you have to be, then, then you also risk um, reinforcing the myth or, or at least um, at least not not being effective. And I think also it's it, the, another thing that I think is really important that I, I expect we're going to talk quite a bit about is you, you addressed the myth itself, but you didn't necessarily ad address what might be behind it. Why, why my character felt like he had to say that there's been no warming. Um, you know, where, where, is, where is the person coming from? What makes them want to believe that this myth is true? Is there, and, and to talk about, there's a lot of, it can be really effective to talk about personal experiences. So instead of going to the statistics, talking about, have, have you felt like it's been warmer since 1998? Do you notice that there have been all these fires? Do you, in this, in this part of your experience, um, and taking it, not even necessarily, sometimes the best way to debunk a myth is not even to take on the myth, but to take on what you know is related to it. And that can be that can be a little bit tricky to think about, but it makes sense once you get used to it, right? Does that make sense to you guys, at least? Yeah, I think that uh, definitely. I think that if someone raises a specific myth, though, then uh, then if they're already familiar with it, then it's good to address it specifically. Um, but definitely, any time that you can talk about areas that not even bring up the pause. Don't bring up the pause unless the person you're talking to brings it up. Uh, it's definitely an important way to address it. Um, so should we, should so yeah, we try to do it right? Yeah, what I would think. <laughs> All right, so, so at the same party, Shauna, so uh, you, 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 you write about climate change. I, I hear that there's, uh, there's actually not been any warming since 1998. Well, that's cherry picking what a short term period to try to disprove a long term trend, which is illogical. And I'm not sure if I could do this at a barbecue, but if you look at this <laughs> chart that Skeptical Science has created, which I think we can pull up, it'll illustrate how cherry picking a short term trend can misleadingly show cooling when in fact there's been significant warming. This is the part where you pull out the iPhone, right? That's right. <laughs> bring, up the, bring up the Skeptical Science iPhone app. Skeptical Science has this great chart that, uh, that shows a, a GIF of it uh, showing short-term periods can have slight cooling, but the long-term period shows warming. And then the next second uh, important point to mention is on the next slide that the 2000s were the warmest decade on record. And this is not my opinion. This is from the World Meteorological Organization. And so by citing a source that's credible, 
that and not citing a source with an agenda, you can be more pers persuasive. So this is a chart created by Washington Post to make World Meteorological uh, Organization data more palatable. And a third point that you can bring up is that much of the warming has gone into the ocean, which Skeptical Science, again, has a great um, graphic in illustrating this. And I definitely do think that you had a good point, Josh, when you're talking about um, just personally relating to people versus just debunking, and I can get into that more um, of how you would talk to someone more generally about climate change, talking about relating it to their lives. Uh, when I do my presentation soon after. So I hope that that was a better debunking. Um, I think that by bringing it to three points, uh, that is more persuasive. And um, I think also um, by not repeating the myth, it's better. You know that graphics are harder to dispute or ignore. Um, and we also know that uh, surprising sources are persuasive, but also more authoritative sources. Uh, if I think definitely when you were talking about motive, if they cite a source that has fossil fuel funding, for instance, it's always good to note that to kind of give people um, a sense of why they might be motivated to repeat that, that myth. And I think in terms of sources, it's also really valuable to tell people how they can can they do that? Can they get that data themselves? If they, they won't actually do it necessarily, but just knowing that. You know, in talking about evolution, sometimes we'll say, you know, you say that, that there's all of this creationist research and that evolution is useless, but go to PubMed. It's a free, go to Google Scholar. Go to, you can do this search yourself. Look for papers mm -hmm. that use evolution. Look for papers that use creationism. You won't find any of the latter. You'll find a ton of the former. So it's not my personal credibility that's on the line. It's, you can go to the, the, uh, you know, the the WMO's website and download these data and chart them yourself and see that it's not it's not that I magically chose one really warm El Nino year in 1998 mm -hmm. as as an arbitrary starting point. No matter what you do, unless you are really being unless you're really cherry picking that starting point, it's warming. There's a little bit of variation around that, and but. As a, as a trend, it's clear what it is. And even if they don't actually check it themselves, the fact that I told them how they could makes me more credible. And that you told them where they could look for the source, that you told them, you know, it's not just me, it's not just I think this. It's, you know, well-respected group like that. Um, there's a, we've got a couple quick questions. Um, John, I'm not sure if this is still true, but uh, someone felt like you were a little bit, uh, you weren't loud enough. They were having trouble hearing you. Oh. I'm, I'm not having so much okay, of a problem, uh, but I don't know. It's 6 a.m. here and it's still dark. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, like, maybe one coffee wasn't enough. I thought it would be enough, but I probably should have gone two or three coffees. I, I meant to, <laughs> to have everyone give, give John a big round of applause for joining us at, at 6 a.m. Brisbane time. So thank you. Uh, some people are wondering, how do you tell non-scientists politely that they're unqualified to draw scientific conclusions on their own? Which is sort of, it's the flip side of what I was saying that, you know, having them check the information for themselves. Um, and I think it is important to say there are a lot of smart people who've spent a lot of time on this and your random blog is probably not going to overthrow all of modern science. But it's also important for people to know how they could... To, to be able to own the science to some extent. It's not magic, it's not secret. It is out there for them to get at. So how do we, how do we walk that line? I, I don't think that uh, telling people that they're unqualified is a very effective strategy because it will just, it will, it's, you're really threatening their identity then. And, and once you've done that, then you're not gonna have any uh, 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 effectiveness in trying to persuade them about the science. They were decided. So you know, the walls would have gone up by that point. So, so, and often I'll get. A, I'm giving a talk, and someone in the audience will throw a climate myth at me, and and I and I try to be as positive about that as possible. I like 
affirm that you know it's, that's a good question or it's an interesting question or it's it's it, that's it's something really worth looking at and and, and you, you need to affirm people um, and and affirm that skepticism is a good thing genuine scientific scientific skepticism rather than try to to uh, make them feel like idiots yeah I, yeah, I definitely agree, and I think that what the confusion here might be that you have to decide who your audience is first. So if the person repeating it is not a scientist, but they're still persuadable, I don't think that telling them, well, you're not a scientist, so you wouldn't know, will be as persuadable as convincing them on the facts and you know showing them how they can go to Skeptical Science or WMO's website and chart it themselves. On the other hand, I think that pointing out that a source that they're relying on is not a scientist um, might be persuadable to say, well, your source has these credibility issues, let's go to a more credible source. So it, it depends. If discrediting your, the, the person you're talking to source is credible, but you know, if, if they're persuadable, don't alienate them. And uh, but, but even, sorry, sorry and, but even when there is someone like if, all right, so imagine I'm talking to a room and, and a person asks me a question and they may or may not be persuadable, but when I talk to them, and this can apply to a classroom or, or any, uh, even a discussion in a comment thread, I, I take the mindset that the people, the person I'm talking to when I answer that question is everyone else in the room. So, so I'm yeah. talking to them, but I'm, I'm answering on behalf of every onlooker in the room who may or may not be persuadable. And, and what I say and how I say are often equally important. And often, you know, the, the person who is deeply, deeply committed to <clears throat> climate change denial or to creationism or to another sort of science denial, in five minutes at a barbecue or in an hour long or, or a, a semester long class, you might not change their mind. But you, you'll plant a seed, which is helpful. But like you said, the, there's, there's everybody else there. And they may not understand the details of everything you're getting into. You and the denier have spent a lot of time reading up on this and studying it. So you're going to get into issues that your audience doesn't understand what the hell you're talking about. But they understand if you're being a jerk, they'll notice that. And that makes you less crazy. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, the, and the same yeah. thing on comment threads, right? The number of the, you know, maybe one person in a hundred who reads a given blog post leaves a comment. You know, at most. And so the, the long, angry, vitriolic comment threads that you get yourself embroiled in are being read by a lot of people who are not interested in that, but they're still responding to, to your, how you're behaving. And so I think it's really important to, to be thinking about that audience as well as the, the person you're talking to directly, who also your affect is going to matter if you're being nice to them it makes it harder for them to think that you're some evil atheist or evil hippie or whatever it is that they think people like you are and people like them have to hate. There's a, a question, Shauna, that I think was related to what you were saying. Uh, Bruce Davidson is wondering, how do you use the self-interest of the fossil fuel industry to question the validity of their assertions? Because it's tricky. If, if they trust that source, then just saying, oh, that's a fossil fuel source, that may just make you sound like you hate business. So how do you? So it's an interesting question. How do you? How do you say that's not a credible source because it's a fossil fueled source, without necessarily denigrating the entire industry? Yeah. Yeah. So I, what this goes back to me for to me for me is um, the debunked handbook saying people prefer an incorrect story to an incomplete story. So definitely you debunk them on the facts and rebutting their argument. Uh, but then after you rebut their argument, there's an incomplete part in there. Why would that person lie to me? And so you say, well, it's in their business interest to lie to you because their business is threatened by the rise of renewable energy at the expense of fossil fuels. So I think that completing that circle is important um, and you can gauge it based on who you're talking to but I, most people that I've talked to haven't thought that it was attacking business to mention that someone has you know that money motivates right 
And, and I think there's uh, two aspects to discrediting a, a misleading source. Um, the first, I mean, we've covered this, but just sort of encapsulating it. Um, the first aspect is explaining how they distort the science. And then the second mm -hmm. aspect is why they're doing it. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so it's not just saying, oh, those guys are evil. It, it's saying, well, these guys are distorting the science by cherry picking or by, by um, uh, casting doubt on the consensus or, or whatever technique they're using. And, and then, as, as Shauna says, it's, it's just a human, um, there's a human need to understand why, to have causal explanations for things. Mm -hmm. And so, so the natural question they'll have is, well, why do they do that? And so mm -hmm. it's quite simple. It's, it's in their self-interest to do so. And it can... And it may be that there could be another reason that they're motivated to do that if the fossil fuel funding isn't true or you don't think it will be persuasive for that particular person. You could also talk about you know, the psychology of uh, people not believing myths that threaten their world view. And so they think that large-scale climate action threatens their world view, so then they deny climate change so that they don't have to have, they don't have to have that cognitive dissonance. Yeah, so I think we're getting into a bunch of the things. I know you guys both prepared some presentations, so, and we've, I think, touched on some of the things that you were going to talk about, but why don't we jump into those and then come back to, there are a bunch of other great questions, but some of them may even be answered in the course of the presentations. So why don't we go ahead and do that? And John, you were going to start us off, right? Okay, so I'm going to talk very generally, and then Sean is going to get a bit more practical. But, but what I want to talk about is, uh, over the last two and a half years, I've been um, doing a PhD research on misinformation and how to respond to it, how do we neutralize it. And, and through the course of that research, I came upon this, this um, beautiful little bit of research done in the 1960s, and, and since then there's been 50 plus years um, of fleshing it out. And that research is called inoculation theory. And it's, it's really, um, really encapsulates uh, everything that I'd been talking about in the debunking handbook and, and, and in other, other um, work that I've had published. And there's really two elements to inoculation theory. The, the first is that uh, it, it basically um, says that breaks down science communication into two types of information. And the first type is vitamins. Um, which is like explaining the science to people. And so just like vitamins make people stronger and healthier, explaining the science to people gives them a stronger, healthier understanding of the science. And, and that's, that's most of what we do as science communicators, and it's, it's the most important part of science communication. But the, the thing about vitamins is it doesn't necessarily help people when they encounter a virus. So the thing you also need to do if you want people to build immunity to a virus, is give them a flu shot. And so what inoculation theory explored was the idea that maybe you could apply that, that vaccination principle with information as well. And so there's been 50 years of experiments of testing, exposing people to a weaker version of the misinformation and then seeing how they go uh, when they receive um, real misinformation. And what they found was when people just received vitamins, just explaining the science, that didn't equip them when they received the real misinformation. But if you gave them a flu shot as well, then the misinformation is neutralized. They've developed immunity. And, and so there's a, a, a great quote from a, a professor in um, ethics here in Australia, Clive Hamilton. And it really gets to the heart of the, the what inoculation theory is telling us. And that's that we're not going to um, change the minds of people who are hardcore science deniers because what's driving their denial is not about facts and evidence. So presenting facts and evidence to them isn't going to have that much effect. So who we need to be targeting is the undecided majority. Um, those are the people that we need to be presenting us our science communication to and and making sure that they're not vulnerable to the to the misinformation that comes from science deniers so how do we um how do we build 
existence? How do we give people that flu shot? Now, just, actually, I'm going to go back one. Because when I read this inoculation theory, I thought, oh, well, oh, that's great. That's the same structure that I put in the debunking handbook. So I'm, I'm glad we got that right. But uh, what I find, what I found a useful resource for um, when I'm trying to develop flu shots is there's a paper by Diethelm and McKee. Sorry, I didn't put the reference there. Where, but Diethelm and McKee look at uh, a whole range of different movements uh, that deny a scientific consensus, including climate denial and evolution denial. And they find that with all these movements, they all have five characteristics in common. They, they try to promote the impression of a fake debate. They uh, use logical fallacies like non sequiturs and straw man arguments. They, they raise the level of proof uh, to an impossible standard. So it's impossible for us to prove that climate change is happening or tobacco causes cancer or, or evolution happens. And they use cherry picking and conspiracy theories. And um, all the different climate myths that we've documented at Skeptical Science, um, all, um, they all can be uh, categorized into one of these um, five categories. And so when, when you're trying to explain to people how the science is distorted, giving them that flu shot, you, you need to explain the technique that they use. And so, so I find this, um, these five characteristics as, as a, a useful tool for explaining the techniques. And that's also a key um, to debunking a myth. It's not just about throwing a lot of science at them. Telling them a story uh, is often a, a compelling, memorable way to, uh, to impart the science. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a um, powerful way to educate people. And so telling the story of how the science can be distorted can be quite effective. So, so I'll give you one example, and then I'm done. So hopefully this won't go too long. So I'm hoping that everyone um, who's in this webinar probably is, is familiar um, with uh, this infographic or familiar with this uh, statistic, the fact that 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming. So, so communicating that, that fact is like giving people vitamins. And it's, they have a healthier or a more accurate understanding of the state of climate science, or the state of scientific understanding about human-caused global warming. But that doesn't, even if you communicate that and people are aware of that, it doesn't necessarily help them when they see the way media covers uh, climate change. And usually what people see is a, a climate scientist on one side, um, someone who's often a non-expert, a non-climate scientist on the other side, but all they see is a 50-50 debate between two guys who know a lot more than the people watching the show. So they assume that um, the experts disagree. They assume that there's a 50-50 debate among climate scientists. And so to help people make sense of seeing this kind of um, coverage or, or to making sense of misinformation in general, we need to explain what the techniques are to, to distort the science. And in this case, it's, it's fake debate. It's um, the fact that when, when you see two people arguing about climate change in the media, usually one of those guys is either a non-expert or he's one of the 3% who, who dissent. So, so you, have, you still have a 97% consensus, but the media are just plucking that one guy and giving him a, a, a magnified or an amplified voice. So, so over the last couple of years, I've been researching how to neutralize misinformation. And through inoculation theory, I've come to this. Um, I'm just actually in the process of conducting my last experiment. And for the experiment, um, I'm, I'm testing an intervention on how to neutralize this kind of mixed media coverage. Uh, so I've designed this intervention text based on the debunking handbook and the inoculation theory and, and all this research. And at the same time that I was designing this experiment, a, a YouTube video came out, which was almost uh, e the exact same structure as my intervention, except about a thousand times funnier and more awesome than, than my dry scientific experiment design. 
Uh, and I mean, if you look on the screen, you see it's had over three million views already. And and this is what John Oliver is doing in this video is basically debunking the myth using all the lessons from inoculation theory, which he probably doesn't even ever have ever heard of, but but he just has great instincts as a communicator. And so what he what he does in this um, YouTube video is first of all he gives people the vitamins. He explains that there's a 97% consensus. He references our paper that that um, down 97% consensus in published climate papers. Then he gives them the flu shot. He explains how the media distort the scientific debate by pitting uh, a climate denier against usually Bill Nye. And then just to ram home the message, he shows what a, a statistically representative um, climate debate should look like with 97 scientists on one side and, and three climate deniers on the other. So it's just brilliant communicating. Um, it's funny, it's entertaining, but it also just works on the on the inoculation theory and, and on all the psychological um, research level. So, yeah, so that, that was just briefly what I wanted to talk about was that we need to think about inoculating people against misinformation, um, as even more so than trying to change the minds of, of people who are denying a, a scientific consensus. And the way we do that is by giving them the facts, but also explaining how the facts get distorted, and uh, using um, the five uh, characteristics of science denial is a useful resource in explaining how the science can be distorted. Uh, so there, I hope that wasn't too long. All right, Shauna, ready? Yeah. So um, today I'm going to go over, I think that a lot of people have read the debunking handbook. If you haven't, I highly recommend it, that um, John Cook put together. Um, I think that uh, applying it, you have to ask yourself two questions. Who's your audience and what's your goal? Uh, so to go over it, I was going to first um, go over when you're talking about, when you're using the debunking handbook. Um, I think something to keep in mind is being compelling in person. Um, so related to that, there's this uh, there's this great book called Compelling People, um, and it talks about on the next slide you can see um, conveying strength but also warmth. So the conveying strength and warmth is the key to being persuasive. If you convey uh, strength, but if you convey no strength or warmth, then people feel contemptible towards you. Um, if you can convey warmth but no strength, people feel pitiful for you. Um, and if you convey strength but no warmth, for instance, Dick Cheney, then you give away <laughs> envy or fear. Um, but if you convey strength but also warmth, you elicit admiration. And Shauna, I'll just can and, I can I add one mm -hmm. thing on that? There's a, a presentation mm -hmm. I saw recently that when you ask people about professions, scientists fall in that same strength but no warmth category along with Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of the people <laughs> watching this are probably scientists themselves. So it's worth it's it's worth thinking about that and thinking about how they as they do these things, how they can uh, address that potential deficit in their perception not I know that you're all warm people it's just uh, how you come across and definitely, and definitely you have to think about how you come across to decide um, what you need to work on um, men tend to come across as strong but less warm and women often come across as warm but not strong and so for women the key thing is amplifying that strength um, uh, and so also with scientists um, it's if people have certain stereotypes, they might think of you as less warm. So strength is ability and will. Um, you can convey more strength by having an upright posture, uh, by being assertive when you speak, um, by owning your <laughs> space. Uh, and this is one thing, um, if you're crouching in a corner, um, you're not going to be as compelling as if you are sitting and you're, if you're taking up more space, people think that you feel that you deserve that much space. You're the CEO. You're conveying that people should be listening to you. Um, and this is something that's also 
a male female thing is that um you know women cross their legs and take a smaller space um and then you know like crouch open i can't really do it on the video uh, but also you can so you can take up space and you can also uh do something called being celiite where the bottom of your eyelid smiles uh do you look like clint eastwood or uh tyra banks called it smizing uh and so strength is related to testosterone um and so when you have more testosterone, it actually tends to suppress oxytocin, which uh, is what's related to warmth. So warmth is whether you're likable or not. And the one key thing to being likable is just smile. If you just smile while you're making your argument, you will come across as more likable and less like a jerk, how we were talking about earlier. Um, if you want to persuade people in person, you have to be likable and so you can't be coming across like, well, you're not a scientist, so I'm not even going to pretend like you have any intelligence. If you want to be relatable and empathize with people, um, you also want to mirror their body language. So uh, anything that they do, you do not to a creepy extent, but just you know, nodding your head when they nod your head, imitating some of their characteristics. Um, but yeah, so the key thing is if you have steely eyes and you smile a little bit, you'll be more persuasive no matter what. Um, the second key to being compelling in person is that is on the next slide, which is that um, everyone has a circle of these are the people that are like me, and um, I believe people that are like me. And so in order to be compelling, the first thing you want to do is connect. And so the way to do that isn't necessarily by saying, oh, we're both from Indiana or something like that. You just want to say something that everyone thinks is reasonable. And it's really easy, but a lot of people skip this step. Um, so if you want to be persuadable, you uh, are trying to persuade people that uh, climate change and evolution should be included in textbooks without this false balance, then you can say something that everyone will agree with. Our kids deserve the best education. And because people believe that statement, they are they think, well, this is a person that says things that I agree with and we might be in their circle. And they're going to think that the next thing that you say is probably also going to be true. And so now that you're in their circle, you're able to distance people that are arguing for some, uh, an argument that you're arguing against. You're able to kick them out of the circle by explaining how that person is not like us. We want our kids to have the best education and that person does not. So I, I thought that that would be um, just to complement the um, debunking handbook because we're talking so much about in-person communication first going over those two key things which you can't necessarily do in an article on a news website but you definitely can do when you're having a barbecue debate. Um, but, but there's benefits also to being able to talk on the uh, talk on a website. The next slide shows how both through titles and format you can make sure that uh, the formatting on that is a little off. But um, but how the myth is supposed to, the fact is supposed to be larger um, than the myth. But um, both through titles and format you can follow the debunking handbook, which make which the key point to take away is that you want to emphasize the facts and minimize the myths. So with your titles, you wouldn't want to say study finds climate change is not a hoax. You're basically just repeating the myth. You would want to say another study shows climate change is real. Um, and in this one, the format was supposed to have the facts larger than the myth, but somehow that, um, that got switched around. Um, and then I, I think John already, already covered this. Um, the next slide showing you, when you think about who your audience is, the reason why I went over being compelling is that your audience is often not the person that you're debating against. The Mark Morano, if you're on TV or whoever it is that is already set in their opinion, who you're trying to persuade are the average people in the audience and they decide who to believe based on warmth, strength, and who they relate to. So you need to be arguing in a way that 
makes you and Mark Morano is actually really good at this. He like laughs. He he talks too fast, but and says spits things out too quickly, but he comes across as a likable guy. He never gets angry. You never want to come across as angry. You want to come across as assertive. And humor can also often work with that. Um, the next thing that I wanted to go over in terms of applying the debunking handbook in my personal experience, um, at Media Matters, we, uh, we do rapid response. We also do long-term media analysis of how the media is covering different issues. And so sometimes we violate the debunking handbook recommendations by repeating the myth first because we're trying to get the news outlet to give a correction. And so if your audience is a reporter, then you're going to want to uh, get, you're going to want to say exactly what they did wrong. And um, so in this case, we, we started off by uh, repeating the myth and then said a fact and said the true fact and we got a correction from NBCNews.com. So in terms of media relations and talking with reporters, um, sometimes you just have to be straightforward about what got, what they got wrong. Um, and then the next thing about applying this is that since we know that repeating a myth is often harmful and that debunking is really difficult, sometimes it's not worth doing. Um, so you want to decide whether what you're addressing is a benign tumor or a malignant tumor, something that can spread. Uh, for us personally, we look at if it's something high profile, if it's a new story that resonates, um, or if um, it's something that we can't, that it's so ridiculous that we can make it go viral and discredit that person by showing how ridiculous they are. So I think that in terms of if you're at that barbecue or that debate, you can decide whether if they repeat a myth, you want to go into debunking that myth or whether you would prefer to instead, um, if, if they're just rattling off myths like Mark Morano does, if you could just instead stop and then go over the key facts that you want to emphasize so that they're not controlling the debate, you're controlling the debate. And so um, the last thing I wanted to go over was um, a reporter um, talking to the media um, and people were asking, you know, when do you ask for a correction, when do you tweet at reporters, when do you, um, when do you write a letter to the editor. Um, so I think that when you're responding to um, a news item, the key thing that we keep in mind is that you have to get into the news cycle or else you've just wasted your time. So you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You can always rewrite something that's more comprehensive later on, but you have to get into the news cycle. And if you're trying to pitch a story, you have to relate your story to the news cycle. Um, and if you're trying to do a more long-term thing, get a media meme out there, you need to have simple messages repeated often by multiple messengers. The other side does this a lot, and that's why there's climate myths out there. Um, and in order to get climate facts out there, we have to all be on the same page repeating the same messages over and over. And, in term, and sometimes you might decide that a, you see a bad story and you want the reporter to do something different like next time, they're never going to change the story unless there's a specific correction they have to make. So you might want to instead do reporter relations, aim for the future, um, give them a personalized email, no canned emails, they don't read them, uh, know their beat, and um, make short phone calls first and then later have meetings with them. And then hopefully you can start getting your media meme out there, which is simple messages repeated often by multiple messengers. Um, so that was just a wide variety of things that I wanted to touch on, but the key things there are uh, knowing who your audience is, how you're speaking to them, using that to your advantage. Are you speaking to them in person or online? Are you speaking to a denier or are you actually trying to persuade the people around them? 
And what's your goal when you're writing this or, um, or speaking about this? Um, are you actually trying to debunk this pervasive myth or are you actually doing something else entirely, in which case you might want to take a different aim? That was, I hope that was short enough. <laughs> Great, and so I'm gonna. I have I have a short presentation. Also, I'm just gonna try to run through fairly quickly. Um, I want to leave time for questions at the end, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, and this will cover some some ground already, but as as many of you know, repetition builds retention. So, um, and that applies for debunking as well. That's why people repeat the off debunked things, because even if it's not true, they've heard it a million times. Um, and so I'm going to do it for good. So at NCSC, one of the things that we have, that we, we keep coming back to, that we, you know, you, you look through the history of creationism, going back to William Jennings Bryan, and you see the same rhetoric then that you see now. You see the same rhetoric used by the tobacco industry, and by the climate change deniers, you see it in anti-vaccine campaigns, in all sorts of science denial, these three rhetorical pillars. Uh, the first is attacking the science. It wouldn't be science denial if, in the course of things, you were not trying to deny the science, right? But the, the, the central pillar is, is what I want to talk about the most, is where you attack the, the consequences, where... You know, it's somehow, it's a threat to per someone's personal identity, it's a threat to their world, it's a threat to society. And this idea that, that, that uh, John talked about, that there are two equally balanced sides that demand equal time, is just really consistent. It's something, it's the, the doubt is our product style of argumentation that the tobacco industry used. It's what, it's what William Jennings Bryan was talking about, that Parents in school districts should be able to decide on their own what their children are going to learn. It's an argument from fairness and for equal time, and it's, it's incredibly compelling. It's, it sounds so intuitive. Who can be against fairness? And so, um, you know, it's the... Go back. So the first pillar is, is the standard, you know, in, in the case of creationism, it can be really overt things like dinosaurs and people living together. It can be more subtle attacks on what we know about the shape of the tree of life. And often, science. one of the things that's really hard about debunking science denial is that it gets into n details of science that, as, as a professional scientist in the field, you may not have studied up on that particular little topic. Uh, and if you're not in that field, if you're not a scientist or you're not a specialist in that area, you're sure not to know. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to, to deal with those attacks on the first pillar, the attacks on the science per se. But the, the attacks on the, the, the second pillar, I think, is really important to understand. And this is an illustration from a creationist pamphlet in the 80s that I think really encapsulates that mindset where here you've got the, the tree of biological evolution soaking up sin from the soil of unbelief and producing these fruits of philosophical evolution like mom-child lib, hard rock, genetic engineering, alcohol, humanism, abortion, terrorism, homosexuality, moral education, the whole, anything that's wrong, inflation is in there. All of these things that are wrong with society in this view are the result of of the teaching of biological evolution. So the solution that they see is attacking the tree, chopping down that tree of evolution with the acts of scientific creationism, thus wiping out all of those evils in one fell swoop. If you accept the premise, it makes complete sense. It's completely reasonable. It only becomes a problem when you realize that the premise is flawed, but it's, as a matter, it becomes a, this moral question, which is much harder to overcome than a purely scientific question. And then the, the demand for equal time, this is a, a cartoon sort of dramatizing one way that it plays out, that you know, while people are arguing about, oh, the scientists may not be terribly nice to other people, the reality of the science is unaffected by all of that debate that can go on around it. 
and people can spend a lot of time debating back and forth while, while the, the train is barreling down on them. Uh, and the thing that's hardest about this and that's hardest to debunk about it is this is research that was done on um, whether people accept that climate change is happening. And you would like to believe that the more educated people are, the, the less likely they are to think wrong things, right? So, and it's true that in the U.S., Democrats, political liberals tend to be more accepting that climate change is real, the better educated they are. But Republicans, political conservatives, are less accepting that climate change is real, the more educated they are, and independents are the middle. Education basically makes us better at arguing for what we would have believed, what we want to believe. It makes us better at, argu better at arguing. It doesn't necessarily make us more factually correct. And that's what's so hard about doing debunkings, that we're trying to educate people when we need to be doing something a little bit different. We need to find ways to get people's fingers out of their ears so that they're even ready to hear the debunkings. And that's why the second pillar is so tricky. If you believe that the result is evil, it doesn't matter what the science is because it's evil. Why would you listen to evil? So this is research that the, the National Academy of Sciences published uh, 10 years ago, almost, uh, when they were re revising Science, Evolution, and Creationism, which is a booklet that they produced. And the three messages that they tested using polls and focus groups, the three most successful messages that they found match the three pillars perfectly. The first one talks about invoking the role of evolution and making advances in medicine. So that's saying not only is evolution good science, it's useful science. It does stuff that you like. It's not just a grand esoteric scientific thing that people in an ivory tower like. It's something that people like you think is important. The second one is talking about the compatibility of religion and evolution, that the result doesn't have to be evil. You don't have to think that, that, that God doesn't exist if you accept evolution. There are religious scientists. There are religious leaders who have endorsed evolution. There doesn't have to be that conflict. You can be a good person, as you understand a good person to be, and accept evolution. And then turning the fairness argument around and saying that it's unfair to impose one person's personal views on a classroom full of children. It's un there's nothing so unfair as the equal treatment of unequal ideas. So turning those pillars around that way can be a really effective way. And you, don't often, you often don't really need to know the details of the science to do that or the detail, if you can understand where people are coming from, what is it that, they, that motivates them to want to deny the science? Why is it that they think it cannot possibly be right? You can go after that and you can bring the conversation around to that, which is often the much more important conversation. Uh, a lot of times scientific debates, especially around climate change, you'll be, people will simultaneously want to debate whether climate change is happening and whether cap and trade is the right way to solve it. Separating out the political controversies and political debates that are perfectly legitimate and important to have from scientific debates that are either important to have if, they're, if they still exist or have been resolved and shouldn't get dragged into an ongoing political debate. And similarly, letting religious controversies. How do you read the Bible? There are ways that you can read the Bible that are not, that don't set it at odds with evolution, and there are ways to read the Bible that do set it at odds. That's different than whether Archaeopteryx is an ancestor of modern birds, right? So separating the scientific questions and the religious questions and not being afraid to have those conversations, uh, but, but letting them happen in their own space and finding bridge builders. Some of you may recognize Francis Collins here, director of the National Institutes of Health. He helped sequence the human genome. He's a guitar hero. He's also an evangelical Christian, and he's written extensively about how he how he integrates his understanding of evolution and his understanding of, of, of God and the Bible, uh, how, he, how he relates those two parts of his identity and why he doesn't see a conflict and why he thinks evolution is an essential part of solving diseases and curing cancer and, and doing all sorts of important things. So he can be a bridge builder for people who I can't reach. I'm not an evangelical Christian, so I'm not credible if someone has a question about how evolution and religion relate but I can tell them, go read Francis Collins' book. You know, you can be a good Christian, as, as no one disputes that he is, and accept evolution, as no one disputes that he does. Uh, as scientists, we tend to want, we tend to be sort of science deny, we, we tend to be in denial about the science of 
what works to debunk. We don't want to get into the emotional parts of it. We don't want to think that we want to think that reason rules the world. And it should. I wish that it did too. But the emotional components of, of these conversations are often a lot more important. And if we don't engage them openly and honestly, I think it's really hard to make any progress at all. And that's where coming back to the pillars and, and thinking about what is the evil result that what someone afraid of? Fear is often a huge motivator behind science denial. And in terms of the third pillar, the fairness argument, um, you know, everyone recognizes that there are not two sides to every question. And so finding ways to make it clear why the question at hand is not one of the ones that there are two sides to. Uh, so shifting to a real scientific debate, which dinosaurs had feathers rather than evolution versus creationism? How much sea level rise can we expect in the next century rather than is the climate changing? There are resol the, 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 those second questions are resolved. We know that the climate is changing. We know that evolution is good science. That doesn't mean that there are not unanswered questions, and it's perfectly reasonable in a classroom or in other settings to debate, debate those. It's also useful to separate the idea of, of what I think of as science as an encyclopedia, as a collection of facts, which is part of what's true, but that's not a good way to think about it. It's how people tend to approach the, what science is. Much more useful is to think about science as a process. How do we know what we know? Leading people through that process, helping people understand that it's in every scientist's interest to be able to disprove what other scientists are saying. That's the best way to advance. So if there were good evidence against the existence of climate change, against, against evolution in general, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people who would love to be able to find that if it were true. And that ideas that are well accepted by the scientific community, ideas that are no longer considered open for, for active debate because they've, there's so much evidence, there's been a process behind that. And it's a rigorous process that it, had, had to, that it has had to go through. So it's more trustworthy as a result. Getting back to what Shauna was saying at the beginning about you know, finding credible sources. What does peer review mean? Why is it better that something be peer reviewed than a claim that hasn't gone through that process? And the idea that peer review doesn't stop with publication. A paper that's been out for a long time and been widely rejected that a lot of people haven't been able to replicate is a, is, has also, it's a different sort of peer review than just the fact that it went through peer review to get published. So talking about the nature of science and understandingscience.org is a, a great site, site with a lot of great resources uh, to talk about science as, as a process to the general public. So I know we're, um, I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as people have questions. I know we're up on the hour, uh, but that doesn't mean that those of you who are, are here, uh, you know, I think Shauna and John are happy to stay as long as there are questions within reason. So um, I will throw it open if people have, there's a bunch that people have already typed in um, and I'm happy to, to work through those. And if you want to raise your hand and, and make a comment or, or uh, talk about your own experiences, we can do that too. Uh, some of these I think we may have touched on. There's the question about how do you deal with denial that's rooted in religion, which is something that's it's in, difficult to, to address because people's religious beliefs are really deeply held. Do you guys have other thoughts, especially around climate change? This question is, you know, if someone's saying God won't allow man to change the climate to threaten mankind's existence, uh, what do you say about that? Well, I think that uh, when the first three ones that you went through that were effective uh, rebuttals for evolution, uh, George Lakoff has done research on um, framing in terms of morality and you know, if you're rebutting a moral frame, then you have to bring your own morality to it. Uh, so I think that, you know, when you're talking about evolution and talking about, well, our kids need to understand evolution because if they understand evolution, they might be able to find a cure for cancer, uh, for type of cancer. Um, and if you're doing something on climate change, I think that talking about the moral impact of addressing climate change, how you know, how climate change is the greatest moral issue of our time, or framing it in whatever morality you view it in, then you'll persuade the people that are persuadable 
and if their worldview doesn't involve your morality, then you can try to find a, a, a source that has their morality, as you talked about, that could insert in there. But um, the persuadable people are, are going to be people that share your morality. And if you talk about it in that moral frame and activate that moral frame for them. Oh, sorry, John, you're, you're muted. Hold on just a sec. All right, there you go. On the question of religion, too, um, a, friend mine, uh, a friend of mine, a Christian who goes to the same church that I go to, once asked me, John, you're into this whole science thing. What, what's this story about the, the Earth being millions of years old or, or being older than 6,000 years old? And I had to think very carefully about how to respond. And so I said, the structure of my response was to firstly say, to point out that, that the science about how old the Earth is doesn't conflict with um, our Christian beliefs. There's, there's, no, there's no conflict there. It doesn't threaten our, our beliefs. And then I went on to explain how the reason why we um, scientists accept that the Earth is, is billions of years old is, is based on many different independent lines of evidence. And so, so it was really about affirming the worldview from a person who shares their worldview and then, and then explaining the, what the, the rock bed of, of the scientific evidence. And she was struggling with it. Like, I think if, if a, um, a non-Christian scientist explained it, it would just the walls would be up. So, so at least it was something she was willing to consider, but it's still a very tough sell. I think, and, and that's one of the lessons is it does need to be from a messenger who shares the, the values of, of the audience, but, but even then you have to recognize just how, what a difficult proposition it is when you're presenting science that is perceived to threaten someone's worldview. And I think, you know, it's also, um, there, someone asked a related question that, you know, are, is it useful to reference evangelicals who believe in climate change like Catherine Hayhoe or the EEN? And I would say, yeah, it's it's really it can be valuable, and it's worth remembering in interactions like what you're describing, John, that you don't necessarily need to change that person's mind right there. A lot of the way that I thinking about de think about debunking is that you're planting a seed, and the seed will grow, and the crack that it's growing in will will get wider, and it takes time, and that it sets the stage so that the next interaction that that person has will widen the crack a little bit more. It may not be with you, it may be with somebody else who widens it a little bit until they finally realize that they really do need to rethink the way that they've been coming at this question. Someone, you, you, you opened the door for it, you, you set things up, you made it easier for that last interaction to, to make them say, wait, I need to, yes, of course climate change is happening. Um, of course climate, of course evolution is real. How I've been, how could I have been so blind all these years? And it's because they had all of these other, they, their ideology was putting all these blinders up. These deeply held things, you're not going to change in an hour-long conversation with somebody. It's, it takes time. And that's, nobody, nobody should go into an interaction like that with somebody who is sort of firmly committed one way or the other, expecting an instant change. It's, it's always going to be gradual. And, and no one should ever feel like um, if they didn't change someone's mind in that conversation, they've failed in the debunking. And there's a, a question that I'm not sure how I'm going to answer this. So, if influential people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, <laughs> Bill Nile, not Bill Nye, fail so miserably at swaying public opinion, why should we even bother trying? Now, this is a good one because um, there's a, um, a law and psychology professor, Dan Kahan. <laughs> who also uh, runs the same argument, but in terms of communicating a scientific consensus. So when our consensus paper came out, he said, well, um, talking about consensus hasn't had much influence on, on public opinion over the last few decades, so, so we shouldn't be doing that type of argument. And, and I think that echoes the question that you just brought up. And I think the answer to that is that we're not communicating in a vacuum. We're not just uh, communicating our science and that's the only information that people are receiving. They also have to deal with all this misinformation that's flying at them from other sources as well. So um, so I think the uh, the solution to this is is basically the message I just gave in my talk, which is 
communicate the science, give people those vitamins, but also give them flu shots, inoculate them against the misinformation, give them the critical thinking skills and the tools to be able to recognise misinformation so that they're not influenced um, when, when they encounter all these other sources trying to distort the science. I think also um, when we talk about who can get in their circle, if you actually know the person that's close to them, you're more likely to be persuasive to them. Um, you know, Harvey Milk, uh, when he was talking about how we can uh, lead to, how we can get people to accept gay marriage, he had people come out of the closet because if they knew someone as um, gay, then they would be, it would be, it would change their worldview um, versus someone that's popular on TV telling them that they should accept gay people. So you, if you're coming out of the closet to speak as a, climate change believer or whatever it is, as someone that they know personally, you will be more persuasive. Um, but I do also think that in terms of saving your own personal energy, that sometimes you recognize someone that's so far gone that you're not and you don't, uh, you don't engage with them because it's, you don't need every single person in order to have climate action or in order to have our textbooks teach kids about evolution without false balance. So I think that recognizing when you need to save your energy is also important. Yeah, I think the point that, that people connect to their neighbors, they connect to their friends. Um, you, know, you, you have a connection to someone in a way that Bill Nye or Richard Dawkins or whoever doesn't. I mean, they know them on TV and they've read their books or something, but that's a very different sort of interaction than our kids went to school together, our kids played on the soccer team together. I know that you're a good person. I know that you're a smart person. I know that you're not trying to hurt anybody. This is something that, you know, even um, when, when my, my pediatrician is talking about vaccines that works really well is to say that she'll say, here's why I give my kids vaccinations, right? It's not... I'm a doctor, I'm very authoritative, this is my expertise, my medical expertise, therefore you should get a shot. It's, I'm a parent also, here's why you should get your shot. And that sort of relationship, um, you know, you, you as an individual, you knowing the person, you know, knowing your neighbor, knowing your friends, can connect in ways that, that Bill Nye never could. And there was a, a question somewhat speaking of which, um, question about the Gish Gallup. The, to what, I, and I, I think I typed an answer to this, but have you guys, for those of you who are not steeped in creationism lore, Dwayne Gish was a creationist who loved to do debates all over the place with, with uh, evolution professors all over the country. And he was known for just running off a list of, in, in a minute he would list a dozen different things that he thought evolution couldn't explain. And then in the debate, the moderator would turn to the scientist and say, what do you say? And he would sort of be flabbergasted and not, not know which of the dozen things to respond to and not have enough time, certainly, to address all of them at once. Um, so the question was whether you guys have found the Gish Gallup to be an effective technique to use yourselves in the course of, of these sorts of interactions. And I'll say that my, my answer was when we were when we were helping Bill Nye get ready for the, his debate with Ken Ham, we actually suggested that he turn the Gish Gallop around on Ken Ham. There, I think in a stage debate, it's a really powerful tool. But I would I would guess that in personal interactions, it would tend to be off putting. It would be it would be very technical and and feel like you're not being responsive. But I'm curious if if you guys have have seen it work uh, in other settings. Well, um, I guess in the debunking handbook, uh, we talk about the overkill backfire effect, where if the debunking is um, more um, more cognitive hard work than the myth, if it's more complicated and longer, then then it's less effective. I'm in the I'm still and in the so blue room. So I, I um, try to keep responses to myths or debunkings as as simple and short as possible. Um, yeah. So. I would tend to go the opposite way than a gish gallop. Yeah, I mean, I mean, part of why I, yeah I, mean, I mean, part of why I keep it simple is because of the debunking handbook, but also because people only have so much of an attention span 
so shorter articles are better. Um, I think that when someone throws Gishkalaf or <laughs> um, that um, I, if there's something in there that's shockingly wrong, then I single out that one thing and make them look ridiculous. Um, and uh, but if there's uh, but if they're if they're doing Gishkalaf, you can also take it say, look, here's what we can all agree on, and then you don't address the strings of crazy that they just threw out there, which, like you said, they might, in a personal interaction, they might put people off. People also judge and debate whether they like the person or not. So I think that you can say, look, here's something we all agree on. And what comes to mind is uh, Bob Lutz versus Neil deGrasse Tyson on Bill Maher's show. Bob Lutz was spouting off these talking points, and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't address them, just says, look, and then goes into the science in a very persuasive way. So I think that owning the space in that way, being assertive, if you're controlling the debate, you're going to be persuasive. So, so the I, I'm 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 blocking the next meeting that's in this room. So uh, we should probably wrap up. Um, I'm going to just I'll, I'll quickly go through some of these questions. Uh, well. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there are any of them that are uh, that can be answered quickly. But the, this video will be archived on NCSC's website and our YouTube page. And I'll, we'll, we'll link to a bunch more resources, including the Debunker's Handbook that, that Sean and John mentioned. John's the co-author of that. Uh, and it has a lot of great resources on the sort of the cognitive science of debunking. And I... Um, I sent a chat message around with a link to it and with links to Skeptical Science and Media Matters where Shauna works. All Everyone who participated in the webinar will get an email sometime not too terribly long from now with a survey about what you liked and didn't like. I hope that you'll fill that out. We do look at that and try to use that to make these better every time. And I wish that we could continue this conversation. I, I know there's a lot more interesting questions and, uh, and John and Shauna have a lot more to say. And uh, anyone who's interested can can write to me or write directly to them and uh, and continue the conversation that way. And maybe we'll just have to do another of these in a few months and uh, and get to more of those questions, right? Definitely. This could be the debunking 101, and that'll be debunking 102, right? <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you so much. Us. Thank you, especially John, for getting up early, early, early. <laughs> Go back to sleep. <laughs> no, I'm going back for another coffee now. All right. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. It's been great.